Gotta Run. This is Will Sanchez. This is a very special episode of Gotta Run because not only is it my 51st episode, it's the first time I have repeat guests from past episodes. My first guest from episode number one is Dr. Dan Hamder, and my guest from show number 18 is Liz Mawalu. I met Liz in a very interesting way through Runner's World. They sent me a link to her blog, Miss Ritz, and to my delight, we had a great show over a year ago. On the other hand, Dr. Dan Hamner I met during my first marathon to team and training. He came in as the sports doctor and did a clinic for us, and he just blew us away with his knowledge and charisma. And I've known the doctor almost 10 years now. So please welcome on my repeat guests, Dr. Dan Hamner and Liz Mawalu. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Will. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Let's get started, as I do with all my shows, a little bit about your background. So let's start with you, Liz. Tell us a little bit where you were born, something about your education, a little bit about your family. I was born in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, uh, lot of, lots of years ago. And I moved to the U.S. Um, 11 or 12 years ago. I lived in Philly for four years, and I've been in New York for seven years. I am a translator. Um, by education, but I've been working mostly in the sports industry for the last year or two. Um, and I do basically a lot of things, and they're all running related now, which is very exciting. Great. On the last show, you mentioned that one of your future goals was to do a trail run. I attempted a few ultras, and not all of them went as great as I wanted to or I plan to, though I don't think I put in the training that I should have. Um, I did the Bear Mountain 50K last year. I, I was injured, so it was a little bit of a struggle to finish, but it was a great event. Um, and, and yeah, I did a, a lot of the, the holiday marathons that they were holding at um, Van Cortland Park. But yes, that's one of my favorite things to run. Any interesting gadgets that you discovered along the way? You know, runners love certain uh, tools. Tools. Well, there's so many things you need. I think I have definitely way too many shoes for even for a runner. I have over 50 pairs of uh, running shoes in rotation. Yes, there's 50? five that I wear, but there's over 50 that are still they're still good and can be used. But um, you know, definitely I, I started wearing this new watch. It's the Motorola Moto Active, uh, which I really like because it tracks your cadence and it has music on it. I like to run with music when I run alone. Um, it keeps me happy. I'm interested in watches. Is it a heart monitor as well? Yeah, and it syncs up with the Garmin heart rate monitor that I used to have. It also comes with a wireless a Bluetooth headset so you don't have to like deal with cables and stuff. Also it tells you like your pace and the mileage on you know it lowers the music and it tells you all that information so you don't have to look at the watch. Oh, oh cool that's very, very cool. cool. Yeah. And it does cadence that's unusual. Mm -hmm. so you need something on your foot or is it No I think GPS? it just no for what I understand it just tracks your arms movements which match up with your leg turnover. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Now, GPS, you know, one of the complaints that I've heard about watches is you've got to start it like 10 minutes before the race so yes. that you can pick up the signal. Yeah. Is it the same for it's this? It's a lot faster. Including in Central Park? Because Definitely. that's where... Yes. You have to wait at least maybe a minute. Okay. But with Garmin, I've had to wait sometimes four to 10 minutes. Doc, yeah. introduce well, yourself to the audience. Well, yeah, I went into medicine late after a little career out in California. Um, I went to Emory and then did a residency at New York Hospital and um, I was trained as a physiatrist, that's a specialist in rehab medicine, spinal cord injuries, closed head injuries. I started running marathons 25, 26 years ago and through the years have become one of the marathon and runner's docs that uh, that's interesting that because a, that at the time you were studying, there was probably no such thing studying, as a marathon doc. No, so you there probably was learned from not. your patients. Yeah, we have. Uh, I know we had um, a couple in town. Uh, now everybody and their brother is a marathon doc. But I believe that you um, you have to be um, not a jogger but a runner to go through the experience of of being able to handle. Uh, all the inner, inner, the injuries that we compulsive runners get. <laughs> mm. I mean compulsive in a mm -hmm. in a complimentary way. Oh, Doc, on the last show that we did together, 
you just came back from the North Pole, a very exotic marathon. Yeah. Since then, have you done anything as exotic? No, it's been uh, a couple of years ago where the Central Park Track Club, the, the team that I'm on, we're waiting for another 70-year-old to, uh, to set a world record. At, Which world uh, record is that? We had the world record for the two-mile relay, so 800 meters uh, four times. So we had it in, as a 60-year-old, and then we had it as a 50-year-old. So we started so at we 50? Had, we started at 50, and 60. then 60. Just then the same team both times? Same, almost the same team. And now, so now we, we, we are lacking one. <laughs> I'm not going to say that that individual has passed away, but... <laughs> he slowed down. <laughs> he slowed down. So okay. we're, we're looking so for a other? fast... 70 year old. Who are the other two members? The famous Sid Howard, the world record holder in many distances, Norm Gullitson and Jim Anna Shansley were the 60 year old group, the 50 year old group, the Les Wright, Sid, and myself, Cliff Pauling. So those Wonder. are the guys in the 50s yeah, and the 60s. In the 50s. The 60s. Now we well, need one more guy for the 70s. So anybody fun. that can run under three minutes for 800 meters, you're welcome. The team will buy you a pizza after every workout. <laughs> And it should be male? Is this a it's got to be male, yeah, unfortunately, because there's a few females that could fit that bill. Well, that's great. So that's uh, that's something ongoing then. That's right. I, I hate to say, yeah, as the seven year old men slow down, seven, sometimes the seven year old women speed up. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> it's interesting. Let's talk about uh, heart disease, because one of the common denominators you have besides team and training because you were the sports doctor yeah. back at the beginning and you're now with team and training in charge of the triathlon mm -hmm, yeah great Liz tell us about what happened when you were 28 I was um, in Philadelphia working I've never had any any major health issues and you know I was the same weight as I'm now I don't drink I don't do drugs nothing and I I ended up in the hospital not being able to breathe. Uh, my heart was functioning at 20%, mm -hmm. and it was, uh, they couldn't figure out what was the reason um, and why I hadn't even noticed that all of that had happened a couple of days before. Um, I well, thought it was, was heartburn. What were some of the symptoms? Yeah, I just thought it was heartburn. Mm -hmm. I just felt some weird pain in my esophagus or in the chest, and I had never had heartburn either, so I wasn't sure. And what it was. So it wasn't yes. a classical, like no. in Hollywood, where people yeah, going, like, oh, uh, my arm, yeah, no. my jaw. No, no. So they came in there for a while. They did a lot of tests, um, everything they could think of. And they basically wanted to, they put me on a lot of medication when they let me go, even without a reason why it had happened. And they, they sent me back, obviously, to do a lot more testing. And they wanted to do open heart surgery. And... I, I, mm. I dealt with that for a few weeks, and I was just so scared. I was in a different country, pretty much by myself, not knowing how to deal with this. And I decided that I, I just couldn't live like that. It was going to be quality over quantity, and I didn't care if I had to find another way on my own. And I thought of running, and I had never run before in my life. I was never a runner, never into any kind of sports. And I just... I'm not sure I remember why this idea came up in my head. Good morning. Not even Argentina, like this a big soccer country. I thought, you didn't do soccer? No, I thought sweating was gross, and I would make fun <laughs> of all my friends for going to the gym. Why are you wasting your time? That's just stupid. And, wow. And, you know, I started really, obviously really slow and maybe, like, run around the block. It was... Now, oh, you were still in Philadelphia when yeah, you started running? Yeah, I started... It was maybe a few months after, um, and I stopped taking the pills as much as my... All my doctors were not happy with me. Mm. I decided it was going to be my way or no way. And it's, I know it's crazy, and I tell people not to do what I do. But for me, I thought that was the only way. And I had to do things my way, and I've always been like that. And my parents are okay with it at this point. Uh, Boy, they gave up. I mean, it was, <laughs> there was no point. But at that time, they must have been very frightened for I you. didn't tell them a lot of, about okay. this because how, how could they deal with it? It's just very scary. So I kept them a little bit in the dark about all of it. So more pressure for me to deal with. We all make choices and we gotta live with them. No guilt, okay. mm -hmm. um, no regrets, none of that. So I started running very little, you know, I ended up with one mile at the treadmill once and I was very excited. And eventually, you know, started to make me feel better. And I, one day run three miles, a friend signed me up for a half. I did the half. That was my first race ever. And running not only made me healthier, it also gave me the mental strength that I needed 
to know that I was going in the right direction and that I could take ownership of my life instead of just depending on little pills and stuff. Um, I felt like I was doing something to make myself feel better instead of just putting myself at the hands of other people and expecting for the best. Mm-hmm. How do you cardiologists feel about this? Uh, oh, treatment? they all hated me. And, and as soon as they would scream at me and tell me, why do you come here and all of that, I would just find another one. Eventually I found one that, you know, would listen. Oh, um, I see. So you yes. went to several yes, doctors. Yes, a lot, lots of them. So the, the medical community was not supportive of no. your... Oh, no, no. They were totally against it. They told me it was suicidal and not not helping at all. And I just didn't want their approval. I just wanted someone to, who would check you know, for the vitals and all that stuff, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and eventually you find someone who listens, even if he doesn't agree. Um, I don't I don't need their, you know, their check So you mark. found somebody who doesn't okay. agree with what you're yes. doing, but is supportive. Yes, and you know, after a couple of years when things got better and he agreed that I was a lot, doing a lot better, he's actually, now he tells me that he doesn't hate me anymore. He's not nervous when he sees me in the, <laughs> in the waiting room. Um, we actually get along now uh, because he put up with all of this. <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah. So you sort of trained him that there's, there are other ways. I think we can all, as patients, um, open up um, everybody's eyes about what we are able to do if, if we want. Well, somebody famous once says, we're all an experiment of one, yes. and you seem well, to I be was, the... Well, I was ready to be the little hamster, and I was I was definitely putting myself out there and taking all the rest by myself. <laughs> you were a test case for something. Yeah, and I don't always like to tell people this, because what if somebody tries to do the same thing I did? I mean, I can't tell people, go and do something crazy. You're it's, an experiment of one. It's a huge one. risk, and I was and, willing and to I, take risks. It sounds like your doctor would agree with you on that. Yes, oh, of course. He doesn't even want his name mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> and how are you today? I'm great. I'm great. Um, things are pretty much perfect. I mean, so they're never perfect. They're never perfect. I still have a murmur, which I've always had. I have a leakage of uh, one of the valves, the mitral valve prolapse, that, you know, you deal with it. And it's nothing that I worry about for some reason. This is something that become part of your life. It's yeah, it's genetics mostly in my case. Yeah. Um, so he thinks that if I keep running, I might be okay. No, uh, now he thinks that, now. Yeah. Now, you know, recently, <laughs> I don't know if it's the New York Times or Runner's World, they pointed out, or somebody did studies, that there is such a thing as too much running. Uh-huh. That everybody has a sweet spot. Mm-hmm. Do you have a sweet spot in running? I think I do, but because I never do too much, I don't know if I could get used to doing a lot more. I usually like to do in between 25 and 35 miles a week. 15 is the minimum, 40. I need to be really rested. I think if I'm rested and everything is great, I can do more, but because I'm always tired, it's always, you know, a little risky. You have a full-time yeah. job. Yes, I have lots of jobs. Besides being a campaign manager and team training, I do a lot of biomechanics coaching. Um, so that's, that's obviously something that not only I like to do, it gives a lot back when you see people that, you know, get injured constantly because of their form or the way they run or after they get tired, you know, what their form turns into. It's, um, you know, it's very rewarding to see how much you can help in just, you know, an hour. And you were trained by the great Lee Saxby. He's amazing. Um, yes, it's it's a very different approach to fixing your running form because it's not about telling people what they should be doing. It's about giving them drills and getting, getting the form to be natural for them instead of something that they have to think about while they're running. We, you know, we don't want people to be thinking about their form while they're running because it adds stress and I don't think running should be stressful. Yes, I had Lee here as a guest and he was totally fascinating. Yeah. And you're right, his, his drills are very simple. So we've got the correct posture, we've got the correct rhythm, and now he needs to be relaxed. So the first thing we've got to relax is the neck. Okay, the second thing, the shoulders. He needs to be aware of the weight of his shoulders in a rhythmic fashion. There, 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 there. Okay, and they, the weight should feel 50-50. Okay, the elbows need to be relaxed. And the elbows should match the rhythm of his feet. One, two, one, two, one, two, three, four. Wrists and ankles often get tense at the same time. So 
So I want relaxed wrists, floppy ankles. Warm rhythm and relaxation. Exactly. Once you have good posture, you know, if you're running straight, you're not overstriding and all that stuff, that's pretty much 80% of the battle already. Doc, tell us about, uh, you said you started late in running in, in your late 40s and discovered you had a talent because I believe you've done a few sub three hour marathons. Yeah, I did about 15 of them. 15? Wow. Yeah, oh my goodness. Low, low 250s. <laughs> and that's between the ages like 49 <clears throat> and 60? 48 and 56. 57 I was running. Um, up a hill or something? Running up a hill, kind of chasing Ray, uh, my friend, um, and uh, the heart seized up, and bingo, I fell forward, kind of knocked my teeth out, and um, and I knew that I had aortic stenosis, in other words, a tight aortic valve, and there was a possibility that I had a um, what's called a bicuspid valve. You mean you knew this before? I knew this before, but you know, it really didn't affect me, so I, I didn't. Uh, didn't think that it would happen to me, so you have to kind of watch out. So I, um, <clears throat> the valve closed down and I passed out. Actually, typical as a very crazy runner, I finished the workout. You did. Yeah, you mean I, you got up I knew exactly you what it was, so I knew not to go too fast. And yeah, I was. Ray caught up. We did three more miles, finished the workout, and went to the <laughs> hospital, got the ultrasound, and uh, it had determined that my valve area was 0.6 when it should have been 2.5 or something like that. So I had to get surgery. I had um, Wayne Isom at New York Hospital to put in a metal valve. So that was the end of my fast marathoning. However, you know, you could still use the anaerobic part of your training, so I started running quarter miles and half miles. At 60, yeah. you and at 60, world we, we, had, we had the world so record. So you're okay to do those sprints? I'm okay to do the sprints, yeah. I'm just not fast at anything over uh, 800 meters. So you're, you, that's 800 meters, you use 50% anaerobic and 50% uh, aerobic, and then the quarter mile you do. 80% uh, aerobic and 20% anaerobic. Now, is so, your cardiologist happy with what you do? Okay, let me tell you my feeling. Okay, I'm a doctor, so I, you know, sometimes, you know, kind of, my feeling is um, you really have to do a lot of reading on ca ca on your on the heart. The, um, you mentioned getting your cholesterol checked. I think cholesterol is like, the, one of the lesser important things, I think that the type of uh, LDL molecule that you have is most important, and that is if it's small and dense and sticky, it will stick and clog you up, and if it's big and spongy, it will flow through. Uh, and I think there's just a lot of things you got you to look at. A, there are still cardiologists that don't do that type of cholesterol profiling, mm -hmm. and it's called LDL. Uh, cholesterol, and they still say, well, you've got to have raise your HDLs and you've got to lower your LDLs, which is true also. But you can have be a perfect shape and be from some Nordic blood in you and have a cholesterol of, of 300 and HDLs of 100, and you're in totally good shape. You know, that's when really? you, yeah, it's, it's like. And the, actually, the most important thing after running is your, you, which you probably had, is your ejection fraction. Mm -hmm. In other words, how much you pump out. Mm -hmm. And uh, that can be, you know, you can have a low ejection fraction, which I have, uh, and still um, be, be in, in, in great shape, but you got to wonder how you got that low ejection fraction. And of course, mine was from the surgery and being on the heart-lung machine, and uh, which is a poor uh, substitute for your heart beating on its own. Right. So there's a lot of things out there. The, the main thing is to find a good, uh, I've been to maybe 15 or 20 different cardiologists and uh, I thought the last one, because he was a marathoner, was pretty good. But he put me on medication and, um, and I was wondering why I was feeling not so good. So I've totally weaned myself off the Didge, the Lasix. They even gave me Lasix because one day my leg was a little swollen. 
the beta blockers, which mm -hmm. they probably put you on, uh, which are real pain in the tuchus as far as side effects, and the, um, the ACE inhibitors. Mm -hmm. I got rid of everything. I feel great. Uh, really? So I you eat don't well. Take any drugs. I always have. I don't. I, I'm on no drugs. No drugs. Coumadin uh, because of the valve. My current cardiologist, he was trying to convince me. He said, in the literature, you know that you can get a 15% increase in your um, um, ejection fraction. And uh, what is your ejection fraction? Mine is low. It's uh, 28 with exercise and 25 with uh, oh, wow. you know, what uh, is, rest at but rest. What is that? Yeah. yeah. What is that? But my ejection fraction when when I was an athlete and it, uh, was 77. Then ejection, my ejection. That, what does that mean? Oh, that's the amount of that you squirt out the each blood. The, yeah, the blood. each time your yeah. ventricle beats. Wow. Mine was putting out 0.77 cc's. And then now it puts out a third of that. Yeah, and I was at 20, yeah. and now I'm around 50, 60. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's fantastic, yeah. fantastic. That's I'm going to let you be my cardiologist. No. <laughs> no. Ejection fracture is best measured with a, a stress echo, but uh, you can measure it also kind of indirectly with uh, ultrasound, which is good. Interesting. Yeah. So you both are similar that uh, you went to a yeah, lot of Yeah, she's doing wonderful. And, yeah, and even wonderful. then, uh, so, yeah, you yeah. did it your way. Yeah, we did it our way. <laughs> we always hear about athletes dying in during the course of a run, and the story is they yeah. had an enlarged heart. Yeah, but mainly they have arrhythmias if they train properly for a marathon. Don't have that much of, of a clogged artery or a coronary. Right, right. A lot of runners have an enlarged heart, and yeah. a lot of them, especially on the EKG, test out kind of abnormal. Really? A lot of times you go to the hospital and they look at your enzymes, and they're not thinking, and they're, that's your liver enzymes that are elevated from the stress of, of yeah. and or your muscle enzymes elevated from the from, stress of long workout, runs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right, right. Yeah. Worst time to get a physical is after, after yeah. a marathon if, or, yeah. or a long run. Worst time. I yeah. go the week before. Blood. I always go the week before. Some doctors recommend taking a baby aspirin a day. Now, what is your, I know, I think for women it's different. Are, are you, do you take a baby that's aspirin? The, yeah, that's the only thing I take, just because, Good. and they, they say before a marathon that everybody should in general, Absolutely. so that's when I take two. I have no idea if that's better or not, but that's what I do. Well, well Dr. Oz, I agree yeah. with her. I yeah. recommend it too. Okay. I, I, yeah. I take two, one in the morning and one in the evening. Yeah. And they've always told me to take a baby aspirin, and okay. I've just been taking one for like the last okay. six, seven years, eight, ten years. We're all experimental. Well, what yes. about you, Doc? You can take aspirin? I take a, a baby aspirin. Uh, I, I take it every second day because I take Coumadin. Aspirin's good. It, it's good for everything. It's one of those miracle drugs that, yeah. you know, you probably yeah. well, you couldn't see, take. Well, both of you have heart issues all your lives. What recommendation do you have as somebody that may be concerned about their heart? You know, what would, as a lay person, obviously, you only give it, you're not a heart doctor, you can only give advice from one runner to another runner. But you said, you know, don't do what you do if you got a heart. You know, listen to your own body. What are you, any other words of wisdom? I am, I'm obviously nobody to give advice to anyone, and probably not even myself. But <laughs> I, well, you know, I hear myself sometimes. But I think you definitely need to do whatever makes you feel comfortable and choose whatever path is good for you and not just listen to whatever your friends, your doctors, your family wants you to do. I, I don't believe in living a life of being scared or not doing the things you don't want to do. That's what's important for me. Okay. It's security it, and comfort that are not important. Okay. So. To did religion play a role in your... I'm an agnostic, so yeah. not really. That didn't help either. I had help. nothing to help at that <laughs> point. But I think, like you said, we're all an experiment of one, and it, people need to figure out what is important for them, what's a priority, and then just follow that. And if they feel something strange, yeah, go check it out. It's just because you feel something, ignoring it, it's not going to make it go away. Sometimes, you know, it's just better to know. Even if there's something you can do to make it better, just do it or not do it. But it's your decision. Right. The denial does not help. Right. Ever. What about you, Doc? Would any mm, advice? A lot of somebody? things. Uh, <laughs> a lot of things going through my mind. I was, I was going to make a classic statement. Stay out of the barber shop unless you want to get a haircut. But uh, <laughs> you have to have. You have to um, do some. Reading um, on your own, uh, you have to really pick your doctors that you that you go see, um, 
and you have to ask for certain tests that um, to see if they will give you those certain tests and and listen to them and see if they're taking care of you and then read the literature yourself but above all don't knock the people that don't have orthodox medical training listen to other naturopaths this listen to chinese herbalists do some you know just keep keep your mind open to other aspects than regular allopathic medical school graduates interesting in closing what are some of your future challenges since last time we met i've, I've changed my life a little bit i I gave up translating and everything that I used to do, and I've, I've turned myself into the sports industry. So I think finding, you know, the best that I can use my skills and talents mm -hmm. within this industry, something definitely running related, you know, whether it's the coaching or what I'm, everything that I'm doing now, bringing it to another level. Um, I think, I, you know, when I go into my 40s, making sure that I'm doing what I would like to do the rest of my life. Okay, do be determined, I guess. Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> well, Doc, uh, Future, well, I know you want to set that record for the 70 year olds. I want to set that. Talent. I want to continue running until I'm 100, you know. I want to. A good example is my dad um, drank too much and smoked too much. He died at 69. He had a twin who did not drink or smoke and died at 92. So I want to carry on and do the right thing for this precious body that we were given. By the, our higher power or whatever, whoever gave it to us, and take care of ourselves in a holistic. Well, Doc, are you manner. a religious person? Yeah, I believe in a higher being. Yes, somewhere along the line, spirituality of, of the, of we three here together today. You know, and there's uh, well, no particular you. deity though comes mm -hmm. to mind right now. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, thank you so much for coming in and sharing these great stories. And, of course, I wish you guys great success in all your endeavors and much happiness. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thanks, Will. It's always good.